Okay, so this is the first seminar. Uh, <clears throat> so in this seminar, I will just give you a brief introduction about uh, Riemann zeta and multiple zeta values. And uh, well, first I will start with the multiple Riemann zeta and multiple zeta functions, and then I will discuss more about uh, uh, their values. Uh, well, basically this will be just uh, an introduction. I will not dwell too much on proofs and anything like that. I will just dwell more on examples. All right, so. Uh, let's get started. Um, all right, so, um, so just like I said, this is uh, an introduction to um, the Riemann zeta and multiple zeta functions. And of course, uh, and their special values, because I will discuss more about the, this. And you will see, uh, I will talk uh, more about uh, uh, multiple zeta values, in fact. But anyway, let's get there. So the first, uh, um, the two objects that I will, uh, the main two objects of uh, this talk will be, uh, so the Riemann zeta function, which was uh, which is well known to you, and is defined by this absolutely convergent series. So um, zeta of s is defined as this infinite sum, the sum from n equals one to infinity of one f over n to the power s, for where s is real uh, is a complex number whose uh, real part is greater than one. And it's natural generalization, what we will call the multiple zeta functions. And which will be defined uh, in this way, actually, let me, uh, sometimes this is called, I should say, Euler Riemann Zagier function. And um, this is defined by uh, this function. So zeta of S1 all the way up to SR is this uh, nested uh, infinite sum. N1 to S1 all the way up to NR to SR. And of course we have to impose uh, some conditions. So just like in the, uh, in the case for R equals one, the real part of SR will be greater than one. And um, the sum of uh, SJ is greater than R. Of course, it's pretty obvious that um, um, when R equals one, uh, the euler uh, Zagier function is just the Riemann zeta function, right? All right, um, well, it can be proven, well, actually it's a pretty easy exercise that uh, um, the multiple zeta functions, right? Just like in the case of, uh, for, for the Riemann zeta function, right? Just like in the case for uh, R equals one, um, this series, let me write it here. Um, is absolutely convergent um, in the region uh, that we mentioned here, right, in this region. So basically in the region uh, um, that's R, sorry, here. Okay, it can be proven quite uh, easily. So I'll not uh, dwell too much on, on, on this. All right, so now I would like to go back to uh, the Riemann zeta function a bit because I would like to uh, make a parallel between these two. I'd like to see 
what is known um, uh, for the Riemann zeta function? Well, uh, and what is and how we can uh, relate uh, that to the multiple zeta functions? And we will see that immediately. So first, let me start with the Riemann zeta function. So the Riemann zeta function, as uh, is known to you, it has a bunch of properties. Um, and the first one, well, I'd like to just start with some basics, just to remind you, uh, do a basic recap of some basics about the Riemann zeta function. Uh, well, the first one is that zeta of s can be extended Um, from the region where it's uh, from real part of s greater than one to uh, real part of s greater than zero, it can be extended by this uh, through the following formula, uh, which is given in terms of the alternating the zeta function, or you can call it Dirichlet um, eta. So. Again, this is just a basic computation. This will, uh, will be zeta of s will be one over uh, one minus two to the power of one, one minus s times this alternating zeta. Um, and here is for all complex numbers whose real part of s is greater than zero. And of course, uh, S is not one. So uh, this function here that we uh, that we have, this one here right, that you see, um, this is what we call the Dirichlet eta function. Or alternating zeta, whatever you want to call it. All right, so in this way we can extend it from uh, here to here. Now, another thing is that, which is important, and this will be important further for what we, for another important property that we'll mention. Uh, um, after. So, zeta of s has uh, the following integral representation. And which is given by in terms of the gamma function. And this is uh, the following. So zeta of s is one over gamma of s times this integral uh, from zero to infinity of t to the power s minus one over e to the power t minus one dt. And here, let me just mention that uh, the gamma of s, this is the Euler gamma function, the classical Euler gamma function, which is just a generalization of the factorial. Um, right, actually it can be zero even here, it can be extended to zero. All right, so, so far we have these two properties. Well, these are just basic properties. So they can be proven quite easily. But now the mo more important thing is that um, Um, so the more important thing is that uh, gamma has an analytic continuation of, uh, of the, the entire complex plane. So the the so the gamma zeta um, can be extended. the whole complex plane um, well this procedure is what we call analytic continuation and it can be done in many ways so except s equals one and this guy is a pole with residue one
And moreover, which is uh, more important, is that um, um, well, the Riemann came with, well, actually, Euler conjectured it. But actually, uh, moreover, we can say that zeta of s satisfies the following functional equation. So this functional equation, and uh, we're gonna define it in this way. So it's given by, let me write it with a different color because it's important. C of psi of s is the same as psi of one minus s. And this function psi of s is defined in the following way. So this is um, um, phi to the power negative s over two, s times s minus one over two. Actually, it's the, what we call the completed uh, zeta. So times gamma of s over two times zeta of uh, s, right? So this was given by Riemann. in 1859. And now at this point, there are plenty of, there are a couple of proofs for this. Um, one of them actually uses complex analysis like contour integration. And another one uses like Fourier transform of, the Fourier transform of, uh, and Mellin transform of a certain uh, integral considered by Riemann involving of the involving theta functions and so on and so forth. Anyway, that's a very beautiful proof. Uh, I think that's the proof that I like the most. All right, so, um, so this is the functional equation which was given by, uh, or proved, maybe I should say to be correct, more correct, uh, this was proved by uh, Riemann in his uh, groundbreaking paper in 1859. Uh, and now this will be, is given as you can see implicitly, but equivalently, if you want to use um, uh, if you want to use like uh, Euler reflection formula or Legendre duplication formula for for gamma function, uh, we, you can write the functional equation in the following way. And the following, so we can write it like this, like zeta of, in fact, let me just stick to red. So zeta of S, this would be uh, given by gamma of one minus S times, uh, if I remember, zeta of one minus S, two to the S times pi to the S minus one times this term here, sine of pi S over two. And you will see this will be important because, um, This will happen for real part of S less than one. And now we can also rewrite it in the following way. Zeta of one minus S is two to the power one minus S times um, pi to the negative S times cosine of um, pi S over two gamma of S times zeta of S. And this will be for real part of S greater than zero. Okay, so we can write a functional equation in this way. And in fact, um, this is, as you can see, it's given explicitly. Well, of course, uh, you still have uh, zeta of S and zeta of one minus S, but at least you have some terms there, like you have some pi, you have some cosine. Of... All right. So now we're wondering um, about the zeros of the Riemann zeta function. So clearly, well, uh, I don't want to go too much into the arithmetic properties of the Riemann zeta function. So clearly, zeta of s does not vanish. Um, when real part of s greater than one. 
Well, because it has an Euler uh, product, right? It can be written in terms of uh, uh, product over primes, power of primes. Um, that's actually a very easy thing to see. So clearly it does not vanish um, uh, on this region. But also from the functional equation, if you look at it, so also from the functional equation, Well, uh, and of course, since gamma, the Euler's gamma function is not zero, obviously, for, for we can see that, um, that the Riemann zeta function, so zeta of S does not uh, um, vanishes, sorry, only at, um, negative even integers. In other words, um, um, integers. Uh, in other words, we say that zeta of negative two k. If you want to write it? We can write it in this way. It's good if we just plug it in here. So this will be gamma of uh, one plus two k times zeta of one plus two k times this guy here. So this, and then we'll have negative five k. This guy here will be zero. So the entire thing will be zero. So you see, uh, thanks to the functional equation, you, we can, uh, actually say that zeta of negative, uh, z, uh, the Riemann zeta function evaluated negative even integers, right, is zero. Is This is what we call the trivial zeros. So these are the trivial zeros for the Riemann zeta function, but uh, I will go, when I will talk more about the values, uh, special values of the Riemann zeta function, then I will talk more about, I'll go back to the trivial zeros as well, because there is a, a much more general phenomenon here. So in fact, you can evaluate the Riemann zeta function of negative integers, but it will be expressed in terms of a Bernoulli number, but anyway, we'll go there. All right, and there's another thing that I'd like to mention, uh, because I said here, the, the clearly, zeta of s does not vanish when a real part of s is greater than one. But also, you can also prove that, and this is not so clear because um, so also zeta of s does not vanish when real part of s is one. So um, when you prove, uh, this is not a very easy proof, but uh, it actually can be done. And uh, usually it's done in any uh, complex and more advanced, let's say complex analysis course or uh, uh, in any uh, in introductory uh, course in analytic number theory. Anyway, so, um, and now the question is, the question comes because we, forgot to mention one region. So as you can see, apart from uh, from real part of S less than zero uh, for real part of S greater than one, we kind of see what's going on. But the question is what happens um, with the zeros of zeta of s in the strip, this strip between real part of s between zero and one, when real part of s is between zero and one. So that is the question. And in fact, the answer is what we call these days the Riemann hypothesis. So these are called non, trivial zeros. So in fact, it is, uh, the answer is the, what we know today is the Riemann hypothesis.
right? This goes back to Riemann, this is one of the millennium uh, problems. that uh, is still not solved. Um, and basically it says that the conjecture, Riemann's uh, conjecture is that all of them, so let me just, it's conjecture that all of them are on this critical strip. When the real part of S is one half. So this is what we call the critical strip. So basically says that all non-trivial um, zeros of zeta of S lie on the strip real part of S is one half. Anyway, Hardy um, was the one who um, actually uh, proved that there are infinitely many on zero, so the Riemann zeta function on this critical strip. Uh, and of course, uh, using um, powerful computers, it has been proven that uh, God has so many gazillion, gazillion of uh, zeros are lying on the critical strip. But still it's a conjecture and probably uh, it's uh, more impossible than you think. So in a nutshell, this is the, what we know about the Riemann zeta function more or less. Well, uh, there are some results, but I don't wanna go into this because it's not the object of our talk. But now in contrast, we would like to see what do we know about the multiple zeta functions? And you will see that the situation is not as good as you might think. In fact, it's way worse than you actually can think of because, uh, as you, well, you, as you have seen, we don't know uh, a lot about the Riemann zeta function, but at least we know something. Um, and for multiple zeta functions, it's actually, it's even worse, unfortunately. And you will see immediately, what do I mean by that? But first, uh, well, it has a, an integral representation, just like in the case of, um, has the integral representation, just like in the case uh, uh, of the single zeta function. So this integral representation is given by zeta of S1, SR, and it's pretty much uh, uh, the same. Well, you have one over gamma of S1, gamma of SR, and here you will have this uh, iterated integral. Right, and here you have uh, T1 to S1 minus one, Tr to Sr minus one. So it's just like uh, basically in the case of uh, here. Um, so here you have e to the power um, T1 plus Tr. Oh, sorry, Tj minus one. Okay, so you'll have something like this. All right. But now um, this was proven like 20 years ago that the function, the multiple zeta functions um, can be extended um, to the whole plane CR, right? Well, meromorphically with poles at 
the following. So SR equals one, SR plus R, SR minus one will be the pulse of these. Um, uh, and of course, um, okay, let me just write it. SR plus SR minus one. Um, so for all, these are all integers. Let's, let me write it in this way, less than three. And of course we can keep going, SR plus SR minus one, plus S1, this would be R, R minus one, and so on. These are all integers uh, less than R. So these are the poles. Um, in other words, if we want to put this in a nutshell, this is like uh, SR um, R minus J plus one. So these belong to all integers less than J, right? With the J going from three, four, all the way to R. If you want to put all these together. Anyway, so this was proven by, of course, was proven by uh, Zhang Kiang Zhao. Uh, so let me just give you some history who proved this. So this was proved by So this was proved by the following. So first it was Zhao Zhao um, so this was around 2000. So he proved it using um, generalized functions. Uh, in fact, he used this integral representation here, this one here, uh, and he sort of defined uh, some generalized function to prove the analytic continuation. Um, of the multiple zeta functions. Um, then there was another contribution. In fact, there are several people who actually proved this. Uh, I hope I remember these names correctly. So it's Akiyama. I hope I'm writing them correctly. So Akiyama, uh, Egami, and Taniga, three Japanese guys. Um, they proved using uh, Euler McLaurin summation. Actually, this is the shortest proof. Um, still, I think this was um, around 2001, I think. Um, then, um, I think um, Matsumoto, this was, um, I think happened around uh, 2003. He proved again the analytic continuation of the multiple zeta functions using melling barnes transform. And the last uh, contribution was um, done, done by Ono uh, Zuka. This was in 2012 or over. It's a, more of a recent paper. Uh, he simplified Zhao's proof. So. So instead of using generalized functions, uh, just use um, integration by parts. It's very elementary, very uh, technical though, but very elementary too. Well, honestly, I would uh, I like the first two proofs. Uh, I, this is the proof that I actually uh, looked uh, more in detail. But anyway. Uh, I don't want to go into too much into the proof. Um, 
But now let me give you a quick example because I would like you to see that the situation in the case of the multiple zeta functions is not as you would imagine. So um, a quick example. Um, so this example that um, I have in mind is the following. So let me take the case R equals two. So for R equals two, uh, we have the following. Um, Um, so just like I said, um, right, uh, wait, just like I said, the situation in, um, in the case R equals two is not as, uh, um, as you might expect. So we should just uh, um, see exactly what happens for the double zeta functions. And so, just like I said, the R equals two case is the following. So for R equals two, we have that uh, this function zeta of x one is two. This is um, so it's defined in this way. All right, so. Okay, and we have the following identities. The first one is trivial. The second one is not as uh, trivial, but uh, we will um, say a few words after. So we have the identities. So, um, so the first one is that zeta, double zeta of zero S2 is single zeta, uh, S2 minus one minus zeta of S2. And the second one, what we'll call the, uh, the baby stuff of relation is that double zeta of S1 S2 plus double zeta of S2 S1 plus zeta of S1 plus S2 is the product zeta of S1 times zeta of S2. All right, so we have this. And now we would like to play around with this a bit, a bit. So by analytic continuation for, for, uh, of, uh, for the Riemann zeta function, we can plug in the value zero. So um, for S2, let's take S2 zero, right? Um, In the above, um, okay. So for S to equal zero, we have, let's see, what do we have? So we have, let's plug it in in the second one. So we have that zeta of S1, double zeta S1 zero plus Z, double zeta of zero S1 plus Z, single zeta of S1 is zeta of S1 times zeta of zero. All right, great. But now let's use the first uh, identity for this one here. This is nothing else than zeta of S1 minus one minus zeta of S1. Great. This will give us um, the following. So we will get from here that double zeta of S1 zero plus zeta of S1 minus one is the same as zeta of S1 times zeta of zero. All right. So now we would like to, so we got this uh, equality here. We have this relation here. And now we would like to see, we would like to evaluate as S2 equals zero. So as S2 approaches zero, what happens? So for example, zeta of zero S2, um, right? As S2 approaches zero. So this would be 
if we plug it in here, so this will be nothing else than just um, what the zeta of negative one minus zeta of zero. Okay. Um, right, we just, yeah, zero, yes, from the first relation here, from this one here, let's say from star. And of course, uh, this will be a zero of negative one by an empty confirmation is negative one twelve minus negative one half. So this will give us a uh, and the second one, zero of uh, S one zero. As S one goes to zero, so this would be um, so this would be zero squared of zero minus uh, zero of negative one, and again. Uh, this would be one fourth minus negative one twelve. And of course, this would be four over two, one third. So you can see the values are different, right? So at first, this looks like um, looks absurd, right? But it can be misleading because the situation in the multivariable uh, case is different. So. Uh, basically, the limit uh, of a function at some point along different routes uh, in the variable space may not be the same. So, in fact, one can show that the, the double zeta functions, uh, um, zeta of S1, S2 has poles um, along S1 plus S2 equals zero. Okay. Um, now, there are some open questions here. In fact, we will, we would like to see what, well, unfortunately, in fact, I should say this, if you're uh, expecting a functional equation for the multiple zeta functions, just forget about it. There is no such thing. And in fact, we even, have problems in defining what are the trivial zeros for multiple zeta functions. So um, we don't even know how we can say what a, a set of trivial non-trivial zeros looks like. So, but let me address this issue a bit. Um, so it looks like that from the properties of Bernoulli uh, polynomials, Uh, the double zeta function, so double zeta function zeta of s one s two. So this guy here um, has trivial zeros. Has the following set of trivial zeros. So this will have the, the so the following set will exhaust um, so at zero negative k negative one one minus k um, negative two j minus one two minus k where j and k are uh, non-negative integers positive integers sorry. All right, and the same thing goes for the triple zeta. So uh, it is a conjecture. So it is likely um, for the triple zeta. For the triple zeta functions. Zeta of S1, S2, S3. Um, um, it is likely that um, the following list uh, 
will exhaust um, the list of um, trivial zeros. And this was the list given by Zhao in his paper. And uh, it's like this. Let me just, I don't know it by heart. So I'll just copy it down. Let's see somewhere it is. Okay. So, um, so it looks like this. So it's zero, zero, negative K. 1 minus j1, 1 minus j2, 1 minus k. Um, negative 1, 1, negative k. Negative 2, j1, k. Um, negative 2, j, negative 1, 1, 1 minus k. And let's see, there are um, negative two J minus one, two, this K. Let's see how many, one, two. Um, yes, where these um, J1 is greater than two and J2 is greater than two. So this which is likely that this list will, um, exhaust the, the list of trivial zeros, but for, for uh, when r equals um, greater than four, it is, there are many, there are way too many. So now in this case, we can formulate the following conjecture because at this point, we don't even know what happens in, the, in this case. So, we can formulate the following conjecture one. Determine the complete least of set, whatever you want to call it, um, of trivial, of trivial and non-trivial. Uh, um, zeros of the euler zagier function. And another conjecture, conjecture number two. Well, determine the functional equations, if any, if any, um, of multiple zeta functions. Which generalize the classical uh, functional equation. So the functional equation for the Riemann zeta function. So these are the two conjectures. Uh, at this point, they're out of reach. So still uh, So this is what I have in a nutshell, as you can see the contrast between these two functions, between the Riemann zeta and the multiple zeta functions. Well, um, in fact, you will see that even when we talk about and we, uh, this, and the next uh, time we'll devote to this, to the special values of the multiple zeta functions, you will see that there is even more mystery even there. So the question we like to uh, address is what happens when, um, 
okay with uh, with the multiple zeta functions at integers or let me just be more specific at positive integers that this is the question that we would like to answer so at this point I will replace s1 by s2 so these complex numbers will become just uh, positive integers so in other words we'll be uh, talking about multiple zeta about the multiple zeta values so just like in the case of uh, of uh, the multiple zeta functions for k1 kr minus 1 and kr greater or equal than 2 so we define these numbers as zeta of k1 kr as this uh, nested sums, right? They're, uh, they're convergent. They converge very slowly. So it's one over n1 to k1 times nr kr. And of course, uh, because of the conditions that we impose, this will um, define uh, this will define a real number. And there are two things to take into uh, consideration here is the, the quantities is the weight, which is denoted, let's say, by k, which is k1 plus kr is the sum of the exponents and uh, the depth, or if you want the length, which is r. So we call these numbers uh, here, these will be called multiple zeta values. And I will abbreviate them from now on MZVs of weight K, right, and depth R. So these are the numbers that we'll be uh, dealing with. And now the question is, well, as you can see, they're defined in a very simple way, right? But um, Uh, we're wondering what are they good for? And surprisingly, they have applications all over. Um, so the question is, what are they good for? And well, the answer is that short answer is that they have applications basically everywhere. They're good for not invariance. Um, uh, quantum groups. Um, Gala representations of the of the fundamental group. Uh, P1 minus 0, 1, and infinity. Um, these uh, mixed state motives. Or even uh, in physics, in uh, quantum field theory. Especially, um, when we're dealing with Feynman amplitudes. All right. So, as you can see, there uh, have uh, they have applications pretty much everywhere. Well, we're wondering how many of these numbers are there. Like, well, there are like. Oh, these are like two to the power of uh, k minus one altogether. But if we, um, but for r between zero and k, right, for fixed uh, uh, weight, so there are um, um, k minus two choose r minus one. Uh, MZVs of a given weight k and depth r, right? 
So there are plenty of them. And well, we would like to uh, understand what kind of uh, relations they satisfy. So the next question we'd like to address is what kind of Q linear relations um, do these MZV satisfy? That's a, a very important question. So before we um, uh, go answer this question, and we, before we play around with some examples, let me go back to the single uh, zeta value. So um, for r equals one, so the single zeta values or the Riemann zeta values, if you want. So we deal with this and let me just go through some history. So this is defined zero K1 is the sum over all N1 to K1, uh, the, the sum over all N1 greater than one. So this is the, uh, the Riemann zeta function evaluated as positive integers. So uh, uh, the integers, right? And we would like to see that. Um, what happens to, to this? So K1 greater or equal than one integer, right? So let me go back to Euler. This was 7034, where he proved that zeta of two is pi squared over six. This was a, a huge result back in the day at that time. And in fact, the same Euler generalized this in 7040, I think. Um, to all positive um, even integers. So zeta of 2k, this is, um, he expresses in terms of what we call the Bernoulli number. So this is negative one to the power k minus one um, times two pi to the 2k. Um, over two times two k factorial times, and let me put it here, b2k. In any case, this is a, Pi to the 2k times a rational number. And this is, um, so these numbers are what we know the Bernoulli numbers. Um, right, they're rational numbers. And they're defined by uh, as the coefficients of uh, the um, Taylor series of uh, uh, z over e, e to the z minus one, right? Anyway, I'm not gonna go into the proof of this. We know that there are some, they have some, some values, you can actually compute them. Uh, but the one important thing is that all um, odd um, Bernoulli numbers, except with the first one. So from three, uh, the, B, the third one, the fifth one and so on, they're all zeros, which is great. So in other words, this will allow us to, um, uh, to compute the values as negative integers, so zeta of negative k, this will be, we can express this in terms of the Bernoulli numbers. So this is b, b to the 2k plus one over uh, k plus one, b sub 2k, uh, some k plus one over k plus one. So from here, just like I said, from what I said previously, you can uh, get the trivial zeros again. because all odd Bernoulli numbers, except for the first one are zero. All right, so we know what happens at um, negative integers. Uh, now, be, uh, because of this Euler's formula, you can compute um, zeta of, uh, and using the functional equation, And the formula for zeta of 2k, you uh, can compute zeta of 1 minus 2k. And um, anyway, it's just a, some kind of a formula uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of, I don't recall it right now, in terms of um, 
powers of phi. And the even values of uh, the zeta function, right? So we can we have an explicit formula for this. All right, and uh, another thing is that zeta of two is negative one half. Uh, zeta of one we get does not exist. And we can compute zeta of negative one, uh, which is negative. 112 and so on. So this um, goes by the analytic continuation. All right. Uh, as you can see here, I we have a, a bunch of values, but I missed some of them. And I did this on purpose. And the one that I uh, ignored so far are what we call the odd zeta values. So I just ignored this uh, um, on purpose. So um, unfortunately, not much is known here. So what do we know so far? So I will start with Aperi. We got Aperi back in 1978, where he proved that zero of three is not rational, but is not known um, if zeta of three is a um, rational multiple of pi cubed. So not known even that. Um, there are a bunch of proofs for this. So Euler's original proof uh, was. Um, uh, using these kind of uh, what we call these days operating sequences. Uh, but there are also other two proofs which were given by Boykers uh, using um, the Legendre polynomial and some linear forms. And another um, proof, again, given by Boykers is using modular forms. Anyway, so these are the pretty much the proofs that we know at this point by. Uh, um, or a Paris result. Then um, Ball and Rivon in 2000 proved that there are infinitely many many irrational numbers irrational um, odd zeta values. In fact, they proved even more than that. They proved that the dimension of the space spanned by this, the dimension over Q by the space spanned by odd zeta values is greater by um, some kind of, uh, it's, oh, it's one plus O of one, or one plus log two and log s. So clearly as s uh, approaches infinity, there are infinitely uh, many irrationals. And I, in fact, to we'll try to uh, see some other results because there was some um, in 2018, uh, I think Sprung uh, Fischler and Zudilin, This is 2018. So they proved that um, the number of um, alt zeta values, so the number, so the number of irrational alt zeta values. is greater than two to the power one minus um, uh, epsilon times um, like so 
So um, we said that um, the result of Sprang, Fischler, and Sudilin in 2018, so they showed that they proved that uh, the number of irrational zeta values are it's greater than two to the uh, one minus epsilon um, log s over log log s. Right. And this was even better improved by, um, the result was improved by, um, oops. by um, a lie and pin 2020, where this was, um, they proved that the number is greater than uh, um, um, All right, so, and there was another result of, um, which, like I said, this was improved by, uh, by Lie and Pin, who proved that this is the number of irrational numbers is greater than some number, uh, C0 minus epsilon times um, S to the one half over log S to the power one half. So, and this constant is given explicitly, C0. It's a very complicated concept. It's approximately uh, 1.11 or something like that. And then there is another result, um, which is worth mentioning. So this goes, uh, this is Zudilin's result back in 2001, which basically says that at least one of the zeta values zero of five, zero of seven, zero of nine, and zero of 11 is irrational. This, this is the basically the state of the art in terms of the rational, um, irrational uh, zeta uh, values. But the ultimate goal will be the following. Will be the what we call the transcendence conjecture. And basically, this will refer to the fact that we would like to understand polynomials relations in terms of pi and odd zeta values. In other words, the numbers pi. 0 of 3, 0 of 5, 0 of 2 and plus 1 are, are algebraically independent. Over Q. With a set of rationals. So that would be um, um, the ultimate goal. In other words, Let's just write this. Um, um, we want to understand polynomial relations with these values, in these values. And it will turn out that understanding polynomial relations in uh, among these values, it will be equivalent with understanding Q linear relations among multiple zeta values. But before we go into that, let me just, uh, so this is the case R equals one. And now let me go and, um, so this is the case of single uh, zeta values. Now let's see R equals two. So for R equals two, 
So we have the double uh, zeta values. So these are numbers given and defined in this way, zeta of k1, k2. All right, um, and we have that uh, K1 greater than one, K2 greater than two. All right, so we would like to um, see how we can obtain some uh, linear relations in terms of, uh, of uh, double zeta values and single zeta values. And what we're going to do is just a naive trick. And I think this goes back again to Euler, I'm not sure, but let's multiply two single zeta values. So in other words, we'll multiply them in this way. So, and, right. And now let's see, when we multiply these, we'll get the following. So I'm just gonna write it in this way. So we'll get the sum over all of course, at first, let me just write it. So this will be the sum over all uh, n1 and n2 greater than one over uh, all n1 to k1 times n2 to k2. All right, great. But if we split this sum, so we can split it in three uh, sums. So this will be the sum over all n1 less than n, uh, n2, plus the sum of over all um, n2 less than n1. And we have a third sum when they're equal. Um, of one over n1 to k1 and then two to k2. So the first sum, sum is double zeta value, zeta of k1, k2 plus zeta, double zeta value k2, k1 plus single zeta values of k1 plus k2. So in other words, as we, uh, if you see here, let me write it with, with red, in color red. So this is zeta of k1 times zeta of k2 is zeta double zeta of k1, k2 plus double zeta of k2, k1 plus single zeta of k1 plus k2. So this is what we call the first example, the uh, what we call the um, but this is a baby example of what we call the Stockel product. So in other words, I'm trying to introduce some in a very naive way, some operations uh, you know, on this uh, algebra, basically, of multiple zeta values. So this is the first relation that we have. And of course, we can play around. And in fact, that's, uh, uh, let's play around a bit with it, with some examples. So the example that I have in mind, let's see, let's take K1 to be K2 to be equal to two. Well, in this case, we have that zeta of two times zeta of two is double zeta of two, two plus zeta of four. But since we know uh, the values of zeta of two and zeta of four, this will imply that zeta of two, two, the double zeta, of, uh, this is, uh, um, uh, so this would be pi to the fourth over 120. So in this way, we'll get the value and um, we can actually compute the double zeta of two, two. In fact, we will see later on that we can actually compute this. Uh, we can evaluate z, multiple zeta values of so zeta of two and n strings of two. Anyway, you, uh, that, it will have a nice formula, but I'm not getting into details at this point. So let me just uh, use a notation here so that, um, so in other words, zero of two times zero of two. So uh, it, this means it's zeta of um, two Stockel two. Let me use this. So this stands for Stockel product, this notation. Or we can also write it like two Stockel two is 2, 2 plus 2, 2 plus 
four. We can write them in this one. So as you can see, we uh, if this will allow us this um, tricky formula will allow us to compute the double zeta value of two two. And of course, this is not is very different uh, than uh, zeta of uh, four. Um, all right, remember zero of four is pi to the fourth over 90. And zero of two is pi squared over six. So wait, okay. So uh, this is one way to uh, obtain linear relations among this uh, um, double zeta value. So let's stick to double zeta value because there is another interesting way um, to obtain the relations. And in fact, this goes back to Leibniz. And um, so another way um, to obtain um, linear relations among MZVs is to multiply their integral representations. So let me go back to Leibniz, which he proved that zeta of two is this iterated integral uh, over these two, two one forms, dt one over one minus t one and dt two over t two. In fact, this could this can be proven e easily by just expanding. Um, uh, this one on one minus t one in terms of geometric series. So this goes back to Leibniz, uh, and this is as you can see here. This is in weight two. So this is a single zeta value in weight two. Let me just give you other examples. So other examples are let's say let me go in weight three. Let's express zeta of three. So we'll have this iterated integral over. Uh, so this will be dt1 over 1 minus t. We can be proven again using um, geometric series arguments that we have this. So this is uh, in weight 3. And, um, and in fact, let me write another one. Let me write a double zeta value. It was zeta of 1, 2. Again, this will be in weight three again. Uh, well, probably as you can imagine, there is a general way of expressing all this, but I'm not gonna divulge it at this point. Um, we will see in the next lecture that, or the, uh, the third seminar that will be uh, uh, this, what we call the Konsevich theorem. So this would be um, dt1 over one minus t1. Um, dt2 over one minus t2. So we have these two or one forms. Uh, again, so this will be again in weight three. Um, and let me write just one in weight uh, five. Let me give you another example. Z of two, three, because this will be an important value. So the, you will write this in the following way. T3, T4, T5, right? So this would be DT1. So we can write it in this way. T5. Okay. So this is in weight. All right, so what we're going to do, as you can see, uh, we will play around again, just like we did with the Stoffel product when we multiply two single zeta values, but we multiply their uh, series representations. What we're going to do is just, we're gonna take these value here. Let's just play around with, uh, with two single zeta values. So that's what we're going to do. We're gonna um, multiply their integral representations. So let's take, uh, uh, um, the first example, example one, because I'll play around with a bunch of examples. The, the, 
Um, so the first example that I have in mind is that, um, so let's multiply zero of two times zero of two. So we have, there's two integrals. Okay, so as you can see, we're gonna shuffle all this together. So let's do it. Um, there'll be six integrals here. So this will be what? Um, this will be the integral over all this uh, t1 less than t2 and s1 less than s2, right? Over dt1 1 minus t1 dt2 over t2, ds1 over 1 minus s1, ds2 over s2. All right, so we're going to shuffle all these uh, t's and s, t1 and t2, s1 and s2. And once we do this, so let's actually let's write them explicitly so that we can see it. So the first one is t1 less than t2, s1 less than s2. We have how many of them are there like, so, so six choose two, right? So they should be, so there should be six of them. All right, plus, let's see, zero less than P one, um, less than, um, S1 less than T2 less than S2 less than one plus the third integral will be S1 T1 T2 S2 plus uh, S1 less than T1 less than S2 less than T2 plus uh, am I missing one? Uh -huh, okay, I'm missing one here. Uh, okay, let me just write the last one. So this was S1, S2, T1, T2. And here I'm missing one. Let me be clear. So and let me keep this one. So I'm missing one of them. So this integral is T1 less than S1 less than um, S2 less than T2 less than one. And plus the last one is zero less than S1 than T1 T2, S2. All right, and now let's see. So as you can see here, we should write in red this um, one forms, right? It has one T1 and S1. We should be here clear, uh, T1, <clears throat> S1, T1, S1, T1, S1, S1, T1, S1, T1, and here S1, T1. And let's see how distance apart are from each other. So the first one, the first value here, uh, it will be uh, zero of uh, two, two. You see here, they're not, see, so it's zero of one, three. And by the way, let me just, specifically say, when we multiply their integral representation, we will obtain only double zeta value. So when we multiply two single zeta values, we will obtain only double zeta value. Then the third integral again will become zeta of one, three. Then here is zeta of one, three. Again, here is zeta of one, three. And here is zeta of two, two. So this will be nothing else than four zeta of one, three plus two zeta of two, two. Wow, that's great. So uh, this is what we call the 
baby example of the shuffle product. And in fact, I only took this because I didn't want to uh, dwell on the two uh, uh, general integral representations of uh, single zeta values because I would have to multiply all these integrals. It would be a mess. But anyway, uh, in the next seminar, I'll, you will see it exactly how we, how we can uh, prove the, the shuffle product of two single zeta values. So in this case, we will get that zeta of two times zeta of two is four times zeta of one, three plus two zeta of two, two. So again, this is, let me just say the shuffle product. All right. So this is just the shuffle product. And um, as you can see from the shuffle, let me just put it back uh, here. So from the shuffle product, we have seen that um, zeta of two times zeta of two is two zeta of two, two plus zeta of four. Right? So in other words, we'll denote this, um, let me just say here, so it's, um, 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 two shuffle two, this is, um, four, one, three plus two, two, two. So this is how we're gonna uh, say. Right. This is the notation for the shuffle product. All right, and but now uh, we can actually, uh, um, if we look at these two relations, just look at this one. So from the shuffle, shuffle product and this one from the shuffle product, uh, we can actually uh, write down we, we can set them equal to each other. And uh, this is what we will call, so let me just write it again. So zeta of two times zeta of two, this is the zeta of two stockle two, which gave us two zeta of two, two plus zeta of four. Oops. But on the other hand, the same thing can be zeta of two shuffle two, which will give us um, uh, four two zeta of two two plus four times zeta of one three. Right, so, um, and from here, um, just like I said, we will get that uh, from these two. So this would imply that uh, zeta of uh, one three is one fourth uh, zeta of uh, four. So this is pi to the fourth over 360. So we have these value for zeta of one three. So in other words, now if we look closely, we can actually characterize all these uh, values in weight four. But anyway, um, we'll put, these together next time. So I just want to play around with this. So well, this is what we call this procedure when we set these uh, two um, shuffle and shuffle relations. This is what we call the double shuffle. Double shuffle relation. All right, but there is another thing that we can do. We can actually, in the same way, we can We can uh, uh, we can do the uh, the double what we call the double shuffle regularization. So double shuffle uh, regularization, and this double shuffle regularization is in the following way. So I'm just going to multiply two single zeta value. So zeta of one times zeta of two, right? So this uh, will, uh, we, in this case, uh, we will allow divergent values as well. So this will be zeta of one stock of two. So 
this would be um, 0, 1, 2, or 0, 2, 1, or 0, 3. Um, but on the other hand, if we use the shuffle for so this will be 0, 1, shuffle 2, which will be 2, 0, 1, 2, plus 0, 2, 1, just by writing in their integral representation. And anyway, we'll see, we can see this. So from here, it's pretty clear that we're going to get that 0 of 1, 2 is 0 of 3. Wow. In fact, this relation was uh, discovered by Euler again. Of course, he proved it in a very elementary way, 70, 76, I think. So this was uh, done by Euler. And in fact, in the next seminar, we'll see another. There are plenty of proofs for this relation. In fact, even generalization of this and so on and so forth. But uh, in the second seminar, we'll see a, a proof using special functions uh, of this relation. So in this case, we say that we also allow um, regularized values such as um, um, zeta um, stuffle or K1, KR and zeta shuffle k1 kr when kr equals one so in this way we can uh, get some other values as well anyway before i go uh, state the conjecture uh let me play around with some other uh, examples in fact i have a bunch of examples so you see we played around in weight three and weight four so maybe now we can move to weight five for example so so example number, so this was example, let's say this example two, um, this was example one, and now example three. In fact, I'll have two more examples. So now let's see what happens uh, with two, when we multiply two single zeta values in weight five. So zeta of two times zeta of three. So let's write the, so um, by using, so by the Stoffel product, clearly this gives us 0 of 2, 3 plus 0 of 3, 2 plus 0 of 5. But now when we uh, do the, sh the shuffle product, you will get only double zeta values in weight 5. So we should be careful with that. In fact, let's write them. Let's do this. 0 of 2 times 0 of 3. So this is nothing else than just 0 of 2 shuffle 3. And let's see what this will get us. I'll leave a blank here. So I'm just going to so 0 of 2 times 0 of 3. And let's write their integral representation. So the first one is 0 as this integral dt1 over 1 minus t1 dt2 over t2. The second one is the this it's in weight three ds1 over one minus s1 ds2 or s2 ds3 over s all right so we're gonna multiply all this together so in fact we'll have how many of them oh we'll have five i have two so we'll have ten of them oh my Let's write them. So as you can see, let's uh, look at the uh, these one forms were one minus T1. So it will be T1 here and S1 here. All right, so this would be, so let's be careful here, this integral. So there will be 10 of them. So let's take the first one, S1 less than S2 less than S3. Um, less than T1 less than T2 less than one. Plus the second integral will be um, S1 less than S2 less than uh, less than um, T1 less than S3 less than T3 less than one plus the third integral will be uh, again let's skip S1 and S2. Let's move this uh, around T1 less than T2 less than S3. Plus the fourth integral will be um, S1 less than T1 uh, 
less than S2, less than uh, T2, less than S3. So four, let's see what else do we have. Um, S1, less than T1, less than T2, less than S2, less than S3. Last, another integral will be uh, T1, less than S1, less than T2, less than S2, less than S3. Uh, okay, and uh, so one, seven, so the seven one will be uh, T1 less than S, less than T2 this time, less than S1, less than S2, less than S3, less than one. Okay, great. The eighth one will be S1 less than T1 less than T2 less than S3 less than T. Uh, wait, 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 what am I saying here? S1, T1, S2, sorry, S2 here, less than S3 less than T2 less than one, okay. And two more. T1 less than S1, less than S2, less than S3, less than T2. And the last integral, zero less than T1, less than uh, S1, less than S2, less than T2, less than S3, less than one. All right, so we have these 10 integrals here, wow. So we have these 10 integrals. So, and this is dT1 minus T1 dt2 over t2, right? Um, ds1 over uh, 1 minus s1, um, right? All right, so uh, we said that um, Right, when we multiply these two uh, single zeta values, so zeta of two and when we wait five this time. Uh, and now let's, we have this 10 intervals. And now let's look at these, uh, I, I wanna look at the one form where it's one over one minus T1 and one minus S1. So it's T1 and S1. So S1 and T1 here, uh, S1, T1, S1, T1. Here as well, S1, T1, one S1. Uh, and the T1, S1 again, and T1, S1. All right, so let's see the first one, if we look at it. So I will have here, um, um, zeta of three, two, right? Double zeta of three, two. Plus here I have zeta of two, three. Here I have zeta of two, three again. Here I have zeta of one, four. Here I have zeta of one, four. Again, zero, double zeta of one, four. Uh, zeta of uh, two, three again. I have zero of one, four. Zero of one, four. And the last one will be zero of one, four. So in weight five, we have the following. So zero of two times zero of three, which is zeta of two shuffle three. This would give us um, six zero of one, four plus three zero of two, three, plus zero, double zero of three, two. All right. But on the other hand, we also have from the uh, stuffle, zero of two, stuffle three. This is um, zero of two, three, plus zero of three, two, plus zero of five. Let me see. So again, we can play around and um, by the double shuffle, 
shuffle relations. So by the double shuffle relations, um, we have that what? If we set this equal, um, we will have that uh, Z out two, three, double Z of two, three plus three, zero of one, four is one half zero five. So we obtain these relations. In any case, in any way, uh, we will see next time once we do um, next two uh, seminars that all in weight five, all these um, zeta multiple zeta values can be expressed as in terms of zeta of two, three, and zeta of three, two. Uh, this will be a very special um, multiple zeta values involving twos and threes. Um, so um, now, so as you can see, we obtain these uh, relations, uh, but um, now, um, so, um, so by the double shuffle, we will have that uh, double zeta of uh, one, two, plus three zeta of uh, one, four is one half zero five. All right, so this is what happens when we multiply and weight five to single zeta values. But then I have one more example, and I think I will stop after this. Example number four. I'm just going to write it directly. I've done all the computations. So what if we now multiply? So zeta of two times zeta of uh, single zeta with a double zeta value, and especially, uh, you know, because zeta of one, two is uh, zero of three. So if we do the, uh, the stuffle, so this would be what? This would be um, zero of two, one, two, plus zeta of um, one, two, two. plus zeta of one, two, two again, plus, and now we'll have two z, uh, double zeta values, zeta of three, two, plus zeta of one, four. So this is what we mean when we do the uh, stuffle product. Right, in other words, uh, and now we would like to see the shuffle, right? So what if we shuffle? Uh, these two values. In other words, let's multiply their integral representation. So again, and I'm just gonna write it directly. I'm not gonna do all this uh, computations of this <coughs> for this one. <clears throat> again, we'll have the same integrals, but the we have um, the one forms will be three of them, not just um, uh, two. And in the same fashion as we uh, did previously, so this, after multiplying, so after some computations, this would give us six, so we'll get only triple zeta value. So six uh, triple zeta value, one, one, three, plus three zeta of one, two, two, plus zeta of two, one, two. So in other words, let's write it again. Zeta of uh, three, oh, sorry, zeta of two, times zero of one, two. So this is will be zero of uh, two, um, stuffle one, two. So this would be um, triple zero of two, one, two, plus uh, two, zero of one, two, two, plus zero of three, two, plus zero of one, four. All right. So that's again the stuffle. And now the shuffle. So when we do this, this uh, let's zero you know, two times. When we do the shuffle here, shuffle one two. This would give us uh, just like I said six uh, zero of one three, zero of one one three. So we'll get only triple zeta values plus three zero of one two two plus triple zeta of Two, one, two. All right, so this will be the shuffle. Great, but if we want to do the same thing, so if you want to do the double shuffle relation, so we will get the following. So by the double shuffle relation, 
we'll get that six, let's say six triple zero of one, one, three plus zero one, two, two is zero of three, two plus zero of one, four. So this is again, another relation. So at this point, putting everything together, we'll have this uh, Alcor conjecture. Which basically says the following that, well, if we allow even regularized, uh, regularized the fun, uh, values, so regularized double shuffle relations uh, are enough to characterize um, all collinear relations. among uh, um, the multiple zeta values. Anyway, still, this is a folklore conjecture at this point. So, um, yeah. All right, uh, that will sum up everything for, uh, uh, for this first uh, seminar. I'll stop here. Uh, thank you very much.